Hello, I'm Robert Kaplan. I'm the Chief Geopolitical Analyst for Stratfor. With me is George Friedman, who is the Chairman of Stratfor, and we're here to discuss today the various exclusivist beliefs and ideologies that plague the greater Middle East today. Um, the exclusivism in the sense that uh, the feeling of love and compassion extends not to the state, but to a tribe, a clan, a sectarian or ethnic group. In the Middle East, what you see, George, is you see states imploding. You see states unraveling, uh, suffocating authoritarian systems have dissolved. No new institutional structures have emerged sufficient to maintain order. And in the chaotic breathing room have come various clan, tribal, and sectarian beliefs that are fighting for control. And the reason these have come up is not because people have become more sectarian or tribal or clannish. It's that with the breakdown of institutional order, people need protection. And they find protection in their group. Uh, in, in Asia, we have a totally opposite scenario. We have strong states. Uh, from Japan all the way south to the Philippines and elsewhere, China. And these states have become more nationalistic in recent years to such an extent that they're projecting power in the maritime sphere and their and their um, their alleged borders are overlapping and clashing. So you see real a real kind of traditional nationalist power struggle in Asia, whereas in the Middle East you see sectarian and tribe and clannish struggles due to the breakdown of states. Well, it's going to be interesting to watch Asia over the next generation to see how strong those nation states are, are going to be. Uh, China in particular is an area that swings between uh, strong states, weak states, and we'll, we'll see. But it is the area we call the Middle East, which we'll call North Africa and the area to the east of that. That's the most interesting because the nation state that was created there was a European concept. Uh, Europe, out of the Enlightenment, developed a notion of the nation state as opposed to the great dynastic empires. Uh, and they really didn't create nation states in places like Africa or North Africa. Uh, however, when they left, that's what they left behind. Some had long historical identities, such as Egypt. Or Tunisia, for example. Or Tunisia. Others had much shorter identities. Others, like Libya, was more a confederation of tribes Libya and Libya is a groups. geographical expression and a vague one at that. But there is one thing in all of these that we see which is, whether it's a nation or anything else, a community. Human beings don't live outside of communities. Uh, you might have a theory in liberalism of the pure individual, but that's really not how human beings live. They can't. And so what you have here in all of these places are communities, but the states don't match them. So you have tribes, but they have only partial authority. And what we're seeing is the tension between the nation that was created by the Europeans, the state that was bequeathed them, and the genuine communities that exist there. And much of what I think happens in the Middle East in particular, and may well yet happen in Asia, is a reorganization going on. The Ottoman Empire is gone. The British are gone. The French are gone. They left behind something. And that's something that doesn't work very well. I would put it in the Middle East, we have two different kinds of entities. We have age-old clusters of civilization, like Greater Carthage, which is Tunisia, and the Nile Valley civilization, which is Egypt. To a much lesser extent, we have Yemen, which is another age-old cluster of civilization, but different kingdoms within it. So it's never really cohered as a state very well. And then you have these vague geographical expressions like Libya, Syria, Iraq. And it's those places that required suffocating authoritarian rule to hold them together. And that now that that rule has come undone, uh, they've, they've basically crumbled and been pulverized into their constituent parts. Um, 
Morocco is Morocco is like Tunis. It's an, it's another uh, Tunisia. It's another uh, you know historically bound state, uh, so to speak. Um, Algeria, we will see the current leader Abdulaziz Bouteflika is apparently near death, and uh, we'll see if Al you know how how well uh, Algeria does. But what I see is between the eastern edge of the Mediterranean and the Central Asian plateau, the only two real states that cohere are Israel and Iran, uh, with Jordan very much in the balance. Syria is an interesting case. Syria is the descendant of a province of the Ottoman Empire that contained what is today Jordan, Israel, uh, Lebanon, Syri and the state of Syria. And the Sykes-Picot Treaty drew a line which arbitrarily made the southern part British and the northern part French. And a, a group of a tribe out of Saudi Arabia arrived on the east bank of the Jordan River. After having lost the power struggle with, with the Al Sauds. Or having been double crossed by the British, depending yeah. on how you want to look at it. And they had no name for this place. So they called it Trans Jordan, the other side of Jordan. Uh, you don't have nation states. I and mean, when you consider the origin of Jordan, I mean, it's very hard to think of that as a nation state. It may temporarily have a powerful state, but it wound up there by accident. But even more, what's happening in Syria mm. is what, what's really fascinating. Syria and Lebanon was one country. There was no Lebanon until the yeah. French took over. There was and Mount invented. Lebanon, which was a part of Syria, that's of how, greater Syria. That's how they gave it the name. And what you're seeing here is that Lebanon's state collapsed back in the 70s. Yes. And what really took over were these communities, these tribes, these ethnic and groups. And even within the Christian community, you had the Frangias, the Jemiels. You had constant fragmentation. They all survived, they fought, and so on. We now have the Lebanization of Syria. Want, of Syria, where Assad is no longer governing Syria, but he's a very powerful warlord that no one is going to reduce. And the opposition is fragmented among various factions and tribes and is trying to define itself. That model really is what I'm talking about in North Africa. The Sykes-Picot Treaty, which revised the Ottoman Ottoman Empire's province of Syria, these have become irrelevant. The area is redefining itself entirely. And the only European-style state that's actually viable, Israel, yeah. is in the middle of this, sort yes. of wondering precisely what's going to go, go on. In a sense, we have never really come up with a solution to the demise of the Ottoman Empire. I, th I think... Uh, and it, because F, because when the Ottoman Empire existed, the Sultan controlled everything except places that, by force, he was forced to give autonomy to, like the Khedives in 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 Egypt, or uh, or some of the bays on the Algerian or Tunisian coast. So, because the Sultan owned everything, there was no disputes over territory or very little. Right. Um, what the, the Sultan's domain was taken over by the European colonial powers at the end of World War I. They drew lines in the sand. And the, the, the Saddam Husseins, the Hafez al-Assads who replaced the European leaders basically ruled in a post-colonial fashion. The same borders, uh, very authoritarian rule, and with their demise for one reason or another, of course it was an American invasion that toppled Saddam, um, these, you know, the borders that were dr dr that were drawn by the Europeans have basically, are, are dissolving. And we're back to an Ottoman Empire, but without a sultan in control. Well, what we're back to is the constituent elements. Yeah. So what I think I, I really want to emphasize is, yes, we can talk about the dissolution of Libya. Or we can talk about the reemergence of the real components of Libya. We're not very comfortable with that sort of thing. We're comfortable with the idea of thinking of Libya as a nation state. And if we don't reconstitute it or Syria or Iraq as a state, then we have failed. That, that is the way it's seen in, 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 um, in conventional policy circles. Well, you know, in conventional policy circles who see the world as an engineering problem, 
and American or European power as a problem of engineering. We, this isn't working, so we're going to come in with the plumbers. It, it's simply a, a misunderstanding of what community means in these places. And it's an attempt to impose a definition of community which coheres to our idea of the nation state. And it doesn't work because when we took apart the state that repressed the impulses of Iraq, what emerged was not an alternative Iraq, but the constituent parts yes. that engaged in an ongoing civil war at various And that revealed just how artificial the British creation was because the British put together a Kurdish north with a, with a Sunni center and a tribalized Shiite south um, with the Kurdish north being very mountainous and closer in many ways to Anatolia, together with a Mesopotamian flatland composed of Sunnis in the center and Shiites in the south. And it was mainly done to protect the British route to India. It was part of it, Britain's India strategy. And because of its very artificiality, it required extreme forms of repression to hold together after the British left because the monarchy fell apart in night or was to toppled in 1958. Well, re let's remember that the British also faced uprisings in Iraq. Yes. And they brought in a Hashemite related to the Jordanian king, king to try to rule. But I think the, the cynicism of the British in how they constructed the area was based simply on the fact that they had to get to India, uh, that they had various routes overland and through the Suez Canal, and that they were going to construct political entities that were not designed to work, designed to facilitate where their end is. That's how the Gulf Shechtams came into being, and they've worked because of the accident of where hydrocarbons happen to have been found. The fortune of having oil, which raises the question much has been said about, and I'm not sure it's true, but if the United States becomes self-sufficient, if alternative sources of hydrocarbons emerge in China, and, and the price plunges, what happens to these sheikhdoms? Uh, there's a sheikh, and there's a people, and have they been a people together long enough to form the community, or are there other communities? Bahrain is a very uncomfortable example yeah. of what it means. But certainly well, we are I think um, a place like Oman is in a separate category because that is a real state um, in a way that uh, some of the others like Bahrain are not. But we will see because even a self-sufficient energy America will still, just like you diversify your financial portfolio, will diversify its energy portfolio and will continue to import some amount of hydrocarbons from the Gulf. But whether the price of oil stays where it yeah. is now is another question. But what we're really looking at is, the, in a way, the entire Islamic world, leaving Indonesia aside for the moment, but from Pakistan yeah. all the way to Morocco, in the process after the imperialism of the Turks, after the imperialism of the British and the French, after the American intrusions, of trying to define who they are. And I think they're going to define themselves as they always were, as much smaller entities than we're comfortable dealing with. There are many tribes, there are many ethnic groups, there are many sects, and they feel affinity for each other and that affinity is going to define it far more than patriotism. And to close, what I would say is that th this greater Middle East is going to be in turmoil for many years to come, and if, it, and if it connotes any other era in the past, it may be late antiquity, St. Augustine's world, which is a world where the Roman Empire was not fully collapsed, was weakening, but yet new entities had yet to come to the fore and be formed as such. So you had a kind of very messy, uh, you know, a messy world of sects and heresies and fights for territory. Well, thank you very much for joining us.